Please welcome Dacha Keltner, University of California, Berkeley. Hi, I'm Dacher Keltner, Professor of Psychology at UC Berkeley and Faculty Director of the Greater Good Science Center. For 15 years now, I've been asked by companies like Apple and Google and Pinterest the question, how do we build technologies that cultivate human emotional well-being? That effort really depends on the kind of science that Dr. Alan Cowan has carried out in his prolific scientific career, which is the richest mapping of human emotion in the face and the voice and the body and artistic products since Charles Darwin. Now, Alan is CEO of Hume AI, and with his incredible team of data scientists and engineers uh, and basic scientists, he has created the largest unbiased data sets on human emotion ever to exist, uh, and also the, the richest data sets regarding human social interaction. He's also leading the Hume Initiative, which has brought together a group of thought leaders to derive ethical principles by which we can create technologies that cultivate emotional well-being. I introduce Dr. Alan Cowan. Breaking the wall of AI without empathy. Alan Cowan, Hume AI. There are two challenges to building beneficial artificial intelligence. The first is to build AI that can solve a wide range of problems. And the second is to ensure that the methods that the AI learns to use to solve these problems are aligned with human well-being. For example, if I ask an AI to make me a delicious meal, I don't want it to accomplish this by making a meal out of my cat, no matter how delicious. I can try to be more specific, tell it not to cook my cat, but my instructions will never be complete until the AI can figure out what I value on its own. Science fiction has long predicted this challenge, giving us stories of AI that learned to accomplish the well-meaning objectives that we gave it using methods that we didn't end up liking. And these stories may seem far-fetched, but AI is already causing this problem on a global scale. Due to the success of algorithms trained to maximize engagement, kids ages 8 to 12 are spending more than four hours a day on social media. But science fiction has also given us stories about AI that learned to accomplish its objectives in ways that we liked. And the moral of these stories is always that the AI has empathy. It disregards its prime directive whenever it comes into conflict with human emotion. So the question is, how can we bring these, this more optimistic vision of the future to life? Human AI is breaking the wall of AI without empathy. We're training large-scale models using data from around the world, uh, gathered experimentally so that it's unbiased. Uh, I spent six years helping tech companies build empathy into products with billions of users, like digital assistants uh, that can tell when you're frustrated. But the problem was these companies were using data from the internet, which is full of biases. By running large-scale experiments, Hume AI is able to gather unbiased representations of human emotion from diverse people around the globe. This data is difficult to describe in words. What I'm about to show you is a composite representation of hundreds of thousands of facial and vocal expressions from around the world. <laughs> We're able to gather much more nuanced representations of human emotion, and we're able to do it in a way that's free of bias. And with this data, we can train much more accurate algorithms to classify human emotional behavior. For example, we've trained the first algorithm that can distinguish expressions as subtle as disappointment, uh, sympathy, uh, and adoration, uh, and everything in between, uh, and tiredness, uh, and relief, and much more. We have algorithms for facial expression, speech, and dynamic movements. And we're collecting social interaction and longitudinal data to develop algorithms that can use this information to respond beneficially to users. But this isn't just a technology problem. Another challenge companies have faced in developing these technologies is that the public is justifiably skeptical of AI that understands human emotion. So we launched a sister nonprofit, the Human Initiative, which brings together world-leading experts in AI ethics, research, social science, and cyber law to develop ethical guidelines for the use of empathic AI, which we will be the first to enforce in our license agreements. The markets in which we operate are vast. We have pilots with FANG partner startups and labs and telehealth, social networks, digital assistance, soft skills coaching, communications, and more. We have a freemium model in which developers can access our tools and pay for them only once they've launched them into products. 
By 2026, by being the most trusted provider of empathic AI, we believe we can capture at least a small fraction of the revenue in each of these markets, yielding a total addressable market of $1.5 billion. Currently, we license data sets and algorithms directly to enterprises, which is phase one. In phase two, we're developing a platform which will provide developers interested in building empathy into their products secure access to our algorithms. And we'll keep track of the data these products generate using our algorithms on users' devices, giving users personalization and control over how their emotion data is used. In phase three, we'll obtain users' permission to measure their well-being at scale using this data, which will allow us to go back to developers and tell them exactly how their products are affecting their users' well-being, <clears throat> which will provide the first way to optimize AI directly for well-being and pave the way for a more optimistic future for AI. Thank you. Fascinating. But you're human, right? It's you. Yes. No, this is okay. actually a robot me. <laughs> yeah, I'm in Chicago. <laughs> okay, that's wonderful. Okay, questions? We have one here, please. Uh, how do you envision using your technology in products like, like, say, Snapchat or whatever you showed there? Does it have to record my voice and face so to be able to, to, to see what I'm doing? So there's technology for speech, which involves language and prosody, so the nonverbal aspects of speech, um, and text. So NLP is for text. We're doing NLP stuff, too. That's a little bit of a harder space to tackle. Um, we're doing facial expressions. Snapchat has lots of facial expressions and vocal expressions on users, uh, and it's all unstructured data that they're not using to measure well-being right now. Um, on device or cloud? On device. Uh, so we would never upload people's uh, personal data to the cloud. Okay, we have a question here from the online audience. Audience, it's uh, from Germany again. Human emotion, uh, human emotion is said is mainly a. Excuse me. I will do it again. Human evolution is uh, human emotion. My God, is mainly a result of evolution. Do you interact with evolutionary biologists in order to tackle your problem? Ooh. Okay. That's a good question. I mean, this is extremely debated in the field, and people argue about whether people in remote cultures, for example, express emotion in the same ways. What we're relying on is the fact that people in diverse cultures around the world that have been globalized actually express emotion in similar enough ways that we can train models that capture both the culture-specific and the universal aspects of expression. About 30 dimensions of expression are universal, and there's uh, culture-specific dimensions uh, that we're extracting as well. Okay, other questions? Yes, here yeah, please first and then So next. you you explained that you will build up or building up a platform and that the key asset of this platform is the data. And I was wondering about mechanisms you have in place so that the um, intensive usage of the platform increases the value of the of the data assets. Is there something in, in your approach which allows this in order to create a flywheel? So the platform is based on data that we collect experimentally, and that's how we ensure that our algorithms are unbiased. And the platform provides people with secure access to those algorithms, uh, and we can control the usage of those algorithms. In the future, we do want to use data with users' permission in a federated way, so keeping data personal, but also analyzing it on device to measure well-being. And so that will grow into a broader data set. Next, please. Yeah, classical question about around AI and as we're in health, how do you secure the well-being element on your, of your business model? Right, so well-being is health plus flourishing is the way I look at it. And right now, algorithms are trained for engagement and they actually have a negative impact on well-being because they have no idea how their users are actually feeling. Uh, so the broader answer to that is, we're going to be using people's feelings as an output only, never as an input to maximize engagement, always something that should be maximized uh, and we'll come up with measures that indicate that these are good proxies for human well-being. From okay. a mental health perspective, uh, there's also applications in telehealth where there's unstructured data, patients talking to doctors or nurses, and it's currently not very well used. Uh, we can make use of that data to better diagnose mood disorders, other conditions, dementia, and so forth. 
Okay, last 30 seconds for a very short question, yeah, please. Thanks for your presentation. In my uh, opinion, people are individually different. So that means I know some people, if they laugh, you wouldn't see it. So um, is your algorithm able to adapt to individuals on the device? Because then you have not the cloud knowledge and just the individual data. Yeah, that's a really good question. So right now, we try to account for individual differences just by having the broadest embedding space possible, and then you can try to calibrate for individuals. But on the platform, we actually expect users to create accounts. And uh, clients will link to those accounts, and those will offer personalization for how people express emotion as individuals. OK. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was it. It's so fast all the time. <laughs>